Well, it's good to be together with you all uh, this morning, turning to this afternoon. And uh, first of all, I want to say congratulations to all the students, teachers, administrators. It is June 2nd. You made it. <laughs> Couple, you got to go back for summer school. That's your choice. But we're, we're done. We made it through a school year. And so uh, praise God for that. We, we uh, are proud of you guys. And I, as a church, could we give a special congratulations to all of our graduates that graduated this, this last week, this month, coming up this week? Uh, if, if you uh, walked through that at some point in your life, we all know what a special point that is. And I just want to say to you graduates that uh, what an exciting chapter that's ahead for you. Uh, God is with you, and uh, it's going to be amazing as you watch how he uh, cares for you and directs you and is going to use who he made you to be uh, for his glory. And what an exciting time in your life, and we're just excited as your, your church family. Also, we are very excited for Vacation Bible School coming up here on Monday, starts tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, it's our, we've, we've had a lot of applause. We can hold the applause. Uh, no, all right, all right, one more applause. <laughs> about 10 things we're going to applaud, guys. Uh, just kidding. That's the last one. But uh, we're really excited for Vacation Bible School that starts tomorrow. And uh, it's for all of our littles here at the church. And I, I'd love to ask as a church family if you would just keep our children in, in prayer this week. I know we often pray for one another. We pray for kids. But keep Keep our kids in prayer this week. There's grandkids, there's children, uh, brothers, sisters that are coming. And I can remember in my own life, in this church and in other churches, it seems like we're on vacation. My parents always found a vacation Bible school for us to go to. So I've been to many of them. But I remember how much people like you, adults, were pouring love out. And I started to understand who Jesus was at vacation Bible school. So pray for God's work in their little hearts because... Uh, it's a battle in their lives, and Jesus is doing a wonderful work through this church. And uh, so uh, pray for them, and as well, pray for all of you that it's not just prayer today, but you're going to be back here tomorrow night to serve. I know a lot of you guys are going to be here, and so um, be praying for everyone that's part of that. So we're really excited for VBS. Well, this morning we continue our series on the Holy Spirit called The Advocate. And uh, it always helps me to review a little bit, and we're several weeks into this series now, so I want to review for a moment to recap what we've done so far in this series. We've looked so far at the person and the role of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we've looked at what it means to be born again of the Spirit. Isai, our worship leader, a couple weeks ago talked about the battle within, the struggle that we all face as Christians that we're going to be talking even more about today. Uh, and then last week, we looked at spiritual gifts, and part two of that sermon is going to come next Sunday, so be sure to come back for that. And today, we are going to talk about spiritual fruit, not apples, not bananas, not all that. We're going to talk about spiritual fruit. And as we do that, uh, and before we turn today's passage, I want to ask some questions to get us thinking about this topic. And so the first question that I want to ask you is, what does success look like in the Christian life? Ponder for a second. What does success look like in the Christian life? And let me give you the answers of, of a few uh, people. This is one a very famous pastor uh, has said that success is that uh, God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. That the best thing in our life, the thing that can bring God the most glory is when we have the most satisfaction in our soul and delight in God above everything else. Uh, Jesus unlays it for us in the scriptures and he says, you know, well, the, the first and the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. And the second one is like it, to love your neighbor like yourself. And then he adds on as the gospels progress, and he says, and go and make disciples. So as you love God and you're loving others, go and make disciples. Teach others what it means to know me, to walk closely with me, to know who I am. So that's our aim as Christians is to love God, love people the way he loves them, and to help others walk closely in relationship with God. 
So if that is success in the Christian life, I want to ask a second question. The second question I want to ask is, is it automatic for you to find your satisfaction and your purpose every day in God as a Christian? Do you find your satisfaction, your purpose every day in God as a Christian? Do you automatically have your greatest delight in God and live for him in every way, every day? Now that is meant to be a rhetorical question for effect, but I'm going to go ahead and answer for all of us that unfortunately the answer to that is no. We don't need a friend or a spouse or our kids, anyone to testify that's not true. Please don't shame us. The answer for all of us, unfortunately, is no. No, for all of us in this journey, there is a fight, there is a struggle, there are inconsistencies. But hopefully, if we have placed our trust in Jesus Christ and we are on this journey, we are maturing, we are getting better, we are becoming more like Christ, there is progress. A word picture that the Bible uses to talk about success in the Christian life that's used repeatedly is fruitfulness. Fruitfulness is a word the Bible uses to talk about uh, maturity, uh, growth in Christ, success. And so one of the things that we're called to be fruitful in, like I said, Jesus' words, is making disciples. Christians are not just people that are overly kind and positive and nice. No, that's not a Christian. A Christian is someone that is intimately walking with God, giving him victory in the highest place in our life, And as we're walking with him, he's overflowing out of us to other people. And we want to, and we do, help other people know God and tell them about God and help them mature. And the longer we walk with God, we have things we pass on. But no matter if it's been one day with God, one hour with God, one day, or 10 years, or 20 years, or 30 years, whatever God's doing in us, we're sharing it. We're we're helping other people become disciples, followers of God. And, And this is a life of overflowing truth and love, God's truth and love, day by day, hour by hour, moment by moment to others. So again, what does spiritual fruitfulness look like? Well, I want to ask this last question. How fruitful is your life this morning? How spiritually fruitful is your life? Are others in your family seeing Christ? Are they getting closer to Christ? because of how your life is a steady overflow of Christ to them? When people are around you, do they experience the love of God because of your heart, the posture of your heart, and because of your actions, your tone? Does your life, your words, your heart, does it line up with Christ? Uh, I bought this lime tree, I've lost count, maybe 10 years ago, but let's just say it was a while ago. And uh, gotten living in Laredo, we live in a tropical place. It's fun to get into to gardening and landscaping. You can grow so many trees here. And it was the very first fruiting tree that I bought. And I was very excited about this lime tree. Unfortunately, it had thorns. Some of them come thornless. Mine didn't. Got one with thorns. And, and, and we planted it, and I researched, and I talked to people, and they said, well, you know, it usually doesn't fruit in the first year. It usually takes a year or two. So... The first year came, and I couldn't wait, I couldn't wait, you know, no fruit, nothing, no flowers, nothing. Second year, nothing. Third year, nothing. Fourth year, nothing. Fifth year, you get the picture, it just kept going and going. I don't know, after seven years, I was like, you're done. You're done, you're gone, there's a lot of thorns, you're scratching my kids, you're taking up space, and I cut that thing down. I was a little lazy, and I didn't take the roots up, and wow, it started coming back. It doesn't want to go. The fruitless tree. One of the missionaries that we support here at Grace, uh, Bob and Kathleen Gableman, they have a very different experience in their backyard. Uh, I've been many, many times to their backyard. Uh, They recently sold their house. Because of how lush their fruit trees are, I have a home. I don't need another home. I almost wanted to buy their house. Like, I just wanted their house because of their trees. You go in their backyard, and they have a huge lemon tree and a huge grapefruit tree and hundreds of huge lemons and hundreds of grapefruits. And, you know, I've known them for a long time and they're very kind and every year they give me a few. And I'm like, this is what a good tree must look like, right? It's, it's beautiful. The natural product of a healthy plant is fruit. 
So the same of a healthy Christian, of a Christian rooted in Christ, is fruitfulness. So we're going to answer these questions this morning of how we can have victory in our life of being fruitful by turning to God's Word. So I want to invite you, turn with me to Galatians chapter 5, uh, verse 16. We're going to read from verse 16 to 26 in, in one sum together, and then we're going to work our way through it. And the verses are going to be behind me on the screen. And if you have a Bible, uh, you can also turn in your Bible if you want to take notes and read along there as well. So Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. It says, keep in step with the Spirit. But I say, this is Paul writing to us in the New Testament. But I say, verse 16, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, Sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, enviness, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. Let me pause there for a second. We got to orgies and everybody's like, oh, I'm a saint. I'm not, I'm not out there doing that. Let's go back and look at the rest of the list. Fits of anger. I've seen you drive. I've seen you drive. Jealousy, strife, dissensions. Let's continue on. In verse 21, he says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, and being one another. So Paul writes here in verse 16. You can put up that next section of verses here. He says in verse 16, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And then he says in verse 17 that the flesh is against the Spirit and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. These two things are opposing one another. And so if we're going to understand this passage today, some really key words we have to understand from the beginning is what is he referring to when he's talking about the Spirit? And what is he talking about when he's referring to the flesh? Well, as he's talking about the Spirit, he's referring to the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit. One person, but three different natures. And the Bible tells us that the work of the Holy Spirit is to lead God's people in the life that God would have them live. The Holy Spirit's job when we invite God into our life as Savior is to give us guidance and conviction and direction and understanding to help us go towards the life that God wants us to live as his followers, to walk in God's ways, to live a life of surrender and submission to God. Now the flesh on the other hand, we immediately think physical, but it's not talking about the body or physical here. It's not saying your body is bad and the physical world is bad. What it's referring to by the physical is living a life of self-reliance or a life of self-authority, going your own way, making your own decisions based on your own perspective and your own wisdom. That is the flesh, doing it your way and not giving credence or respect or consideration to God's way. And what this passage is telling us is that inside every single one of us is both 
of these things, the spirit and the flesh. Before you met Jesus, before I met Jesus, you were living a life unto yourself. Before you met Jesus, you decided what was good or bad or right or wrong. And so as Christians, every day now, Christ in our life, the Holy Spirit in our life becomes a fight between the spirit and the flesh. Am I going to go God's way or am I just going to go my own way, right? And it's saying that these two things live inside of us. An illustration I can give is the very first time I took a trip. I wish it wasn't on my honeymoon, but it was with my wife, a big trip. This really didn't come out to our honeymoon and then and every trip ever after. Uh, you know, my idea of a good time on a trip starts with the way I leave. We, we're very different than we leave on a trip. I am very relaxed. I am too relaxed. I'm not worried about getting to the airport. It's Laredo. It's not that far away. I'm going to get there. They're going to let me through. I've only been through, let through like once maybe, you know, I, you're going to make it. So I tend to like pack towards the last minute. Uh, I, I'm very, I may drive a little fast towards the airport at times. If we're going out of town and we're driving to San Antonio or Austin and I say we're going to leave at 9, you know, 9, 9.30, 10, 11, whatever. I mean, we're just, the point is to have a fun time and get out of town. It doesn't matter if we leave at 9 or 9.05. My wife, if you say 9 o'clock, is in the car at 8.45 and ready to go, okay? And the bag was packed like three days ago. So the very first time we went on a trip, let's just say there was a little bit of anxiety and tension, Right? Uh, and I'm like, and I was, I was truly in shock. Like, what's the deal? Like, why are we worried? It's all going to work out. And she's thinking like, you're crazy. Then when, when we go on a trip, when we go on uh, out of town, we go on vacation, you know, I think the beach would be a nice way to sum up my ideal trip. I love to just get to a place. I love to check it out a little bit, go for a walk when I get there. And then let's just see what we're going to do. We may, we may stay inside all day and watch movies. We may stay inside all day and watch sports. We may be in the pool for eight hours, maybe the beach for eight hours. I don't know, but it's just going to be laid back, and we may not go anywhere. We're just going to lay down and relax. That is the complete polar opposite idea of what is an exciting trip to my wife. She loves to go to museums. She loves to go to aquariums. She loves to go to architecture. She loves to learn. She loves to study. She's researching. She goes on trips and she learns things that I didn't even know about the world. And so we're very, very different. Now, I can tell you that 13 years into marriage, my idea of the ideal vacation has changed. Let me tell you. Why? Because God brought this beautiful woman into my life that I love. And first of all, uh, she's not here to testify. She was here last service. But I try to leave it a little differently for trips than I used to because first of all, I want her to be happy. And if she's not happy, I'm not going to be happy. The trip's not going to be any fun. So I do my very best to, to be ready. Sometimes, I'll be honest, I don't always give a time. I don't say when we're leaving. That works better that way. I'll just say we're leaving in the morning. I could be very open. That can mean a lot of things. But and when I do give a time, and we have to give a time for a certain reason, I make it a point to be ready ahead of time. Like dress, ready, bags packed. Like what, how can I help you? Ready to go because then she's relaxed and she has a good time. And, and, and I do that, I'll be honest. I, it's better, but I do it mostly for her. But I can tell you what's truly changed about me is now my idea of a, a dream vacation is not just doing nothing. I love wherever I go to do research, even before I go on a trip now, I'm on Google and I'm researching everything and we make appointments different places and I love to go and learn about different cities and different places and all the things that she loves because she's, she has so much delight in those things, you know, I have found delight in them. Now think about your relationship, and, and I'm not the same anymore. If I was still the same, you'd say, that guy probably doesn't have a very happy marriage. If every time we went on a trip, it was this huge conflict between the two of us. Think about your relationship with God. The beauty of God has come into your life. The love of God, the kindness of God. The wonder of God. And if we are still just saying to ourselves like, ah, whatever, I'm just going to do my own thing. Does that, does that really line up? Or the longer that we know God, do we say, I don't want to live in my way, the flesh. I want to know him. I want to delight in the things he delights in. And we begin to change the longer that we know God. Now, this isn't talking about our salvation, this battle between the flesh and the spirit. 
because we know that we are not saved by our works. The Bible tells us so clear, we are saved by the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We're not saved by our works, we're saved by the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so we can come to him and say, Jesus, I've, I've sinned. Uh, thank you for what you've done for me. And, and we can begin this new life where our, our salvation is not based on our good works, it's based on his great, finished, perfect work. But as we receive that salvation, we start walking in it, we have this tension in our lives as Christians. Uh, Paul, who is a very famous follower of God, and we're not gonna turn to this passage, but in Romans 7, he talks about it this way. And so if he has this struggle, imagine the struggle we have. Um, and so look at what he says here. He says, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want to do, but the very thing that I hate. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Wretched man am I. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. He says, I have this struggle. I don't, I don't want to displease God. I don't want to walk in sinfulness and wretchedness. Praise God that, that through Christ I have salvation. I have hope. So let's talk about, you know, why is it that this battle, this tension, this in being fruitful, why is it so important? Well, the reason why this fight is so important is for a couple of different reasons. One, if we don't feel any tension, if there's, if we don't feel there's, there's an absence of any fighting in us, I don't say this to, to shame you or anything. It's just a reality. You might, we might wonder, are we even a Christian? We sometimes do the opposite to ourselves as Christians. And we say we're not Christians because we say, man, I just keep doing this thing. I keep doing this thing. Why do I do these bad things? Kind of like Paul was saying. And we say, I don't know if God loves me. I don't know if I'm a believer. That's the opposite the reason, the fact, that, the fact that you're aware that you are sinning and that it's wrong and it's not good and you don't want it for you says that you know that there's something different and you want to please God. And through the power of God, we can come to him and ask for help and ask for forgiveness. And so the fact that we have a struggle, one, it's testimony that we have been born again, that the spirit is living inside of us, giving us conviction. But when we just give up, we're walking further and further away from God. And if we've never felt any struggle ever, and we probably haven't invited God into the throne of our life or as our savior. It's also important, this fight, because this is what is breaking our world. Do you get those news articles that pop up on your phone about rape and murder and all these horrible things in our world and you just feel sick to your stomach? Where does it all come from? It all comes from the flesh the fallenness of this world. And when we live in the flesh, we're just contributing to the brokenness of this world. And so he says here in verse 19 that the works of all of the flesh are so evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, fits of anger, envy, drunkenness. None of these things are gonna bring about God's goodness into this world. I don't know of how many uh, massive contributions we've given to this world when we were totally wasted. Maybe our family got to laugh at us because we were a total idiot, right? But we weren't helpful to anybody and, and oftentimes we're harmful. And God's saying that's not a work that's of the spirit and divisions and jealousy are not things that are of the Holy Spirit. That's things of this world. All of these things. God says sex is a beautiful, beautiful, wonderful thing that I've created, but it's meant to be shared in a trusted caring, loving relationship. Don't, don't, uh, don't treat it lightly. It's a, it's a precious gift. And what does the world say? Oh, no, we're going to put it in, in TV in every which way and form and just satiate it to look like just going and getting after that is going to bring you joy. No, it's not. It's going to bring you joy in a committed relationship where there's love. That's where it brings joy. Otherwise, it brings a lot of hurt and pain when we break up. And, and it's, that's not the way that, the way the world practices and isn't the way that God wants it to be. This isn't a list telling us all the things we can't do as Christians. No, no, no. This life is so boring. It's the total 
opposite. It's saying that this is not God's best for us, that it's not what's good for our world. And we live in the flesh that we hurt ourselves and we hurt other people around us. Brokenness in our community comes from brokenness in families and brokenness in families come from broken moms and dads. So whether you're a single person or whether uh, you're married without kids or whether you're, you're married with kids or wherever you're at in that journey, you know, we know that God gives us children as beautiful gifts from the Lord and, and we have massive influence in their life to not live perfectly as Christians, but to bring restoration and hope and love because of the work of the Spirit in us. And so this matters because our world is broken because of living by the flesh. He wraps up here and he, 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 go, he goes to the second half of the passage. He says, what is the fruit of the Spirit? What does it look like to be fruitful? Well, it's love and it's joy and it's peace and it's patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Love is having such a high esteem for others that we see them as God's creation, that we, that we treat them with dignity, no matter their social standing, their financial standing, no matter if they treat us nice, they're unkind to us, if they're our best friend or our worst enemy, we say, this person was made in the image of God and I'm gonna love them. I'm gonna treat them with high esteem. Joy is a state of gladness and contentment in our hearts. Peace is being free from anxiety and inner turmoil. Have you felt free from anxiety and inner turmoil this past week? This next one, patience, this is where it throws all of us up. We all just fail. Like, and this, this definition is, wow. Patience is a state of emotional calm in the face of provocation and misfortune without complaining or being irritated. <laughs> I don't, <sighs> but how many times are we irritated? How many times do we gossip? Do we complain? Do we become bitter? Instead of saying, wait a second, God's going to work it all out. It's a state of calm in the face of brokenness. Kindness and goodness in our, in our attitudes, in our actions. Faithfulness is someone that you can completely trust. How many people do you have in your life right now as you think and you go, I completely trust this person. I know, I can 100% count on that. That's godliness. That is spiritual fruit when someone is like that. And the last one's with gentleness. Gentleness and self-control. Not being controlled by the things, but self-control. When I started really making my faith my own in high school, when I started asking all the questions of, do I really believe in God? I, I've grown up in church. Do I really wanna follow God? How am I really gonna live? Am I gonna keep going to some of the parties that I've been going to with my friends? Is that of a consequence? All these questions I was wrestling with. And I remember coming to this passage and I remember so clearly God helped me to see that this is a litmus test for our faith for our walk with him. A litmus test is you, you dip a liquid and it tells you, is it an acid or is it a base? It's a science test. And this passage, love, joy, peace, patience, and so on, says I'm either right now abiding in the spirit, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing the love of God, the goodness of God to others, or I'm, I'm abiding in my own ways in the flesh. And, and I can tell you that because I've prayed this and prayed it and prayed it, it's so easy, it can be hard, but, but if the passage comes to my mind to know really quickly, like, all right, I am obviously not in the spirit of God right now. I am full of anger. I am full of anxiety or worry. Those things are not from God. Like maybe righteous anger, but sometimes it's not, no, the anger is not righteous, okay. Or, or maybe like healthy concern, but it's not a healthy concern. It's a, it's a trying to control a situation or it's a, it's a worry that we have or an insecurity. We have nothing to be insecure about. We were made in the image of God, by God, for God, with a wonderful purpose and a call in our life. And this broken world wants to tear us down and tell us other things about ourselves and make us insecure. And God's saying, no, 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 no. You are my child. You are my creation. You are meant for my glory, to bring me glory. And you don't have to have anything else but these things. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness because you have all that you need through 
me to represent, to glorify God, to delight in God. The last few verses here, verse 24, say, those who belong in Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. It doesn't have to have victory over us anymore. With all of its passions and desires, and if we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit, not become con- becoming conceited, provoking one another, or being or envying one another. So church, question, and we're walking in this spiritual walk, but who's leading the walk? Are you in the front and God's in the back? Or is God in the front? Is the Spirit the one that we're listening to and surrendering to and following and saying, I'm going to follow in His ways. And we realize that we don't have joy, we don't have peace. It's an opportunity for us still to bring glory to God. You are not, we're all broken. But when we fall, we still can bring glory to God. When these things happen, it's a perfect opportunity for us to say, I'm sorry, Robert. I'm sorry that I was impatient with you. I'm sorry the way I spoke to you. And I just want to tell you that you deserve better than that. I'm sorry about that, man. And when we fail and we point those failures out to our kids, our grandkids, our coworkers, our friends, our neighbors, we may do a double take and say, wow, this person's humble enough to admit their failures. Why? Because we know there's a higher standard and it's okay because Jesus Christ died for that sin. So every time we mess up, we have nothing to be afraid of because God is still with us and we can apologize and just ask God to help us walk. And as opposed to the opposite of just saying, I'm gonna do whatever. Like don't bring evil into this world, but we are gonna struggle. Until we get to heaven, we are gonna be in a fight and we mess up, we just give it to Jesus, we apologize and we move on and we do our best day by day to give victory to the Spirit of God. And so in conclusion, how can we do that? How can we win? We wanna win as a church. How can we walk by the Spirit? But we have to change our perspective, our posture to say, just like this passage says, as you keep in step with the Spirit, who's the one leading the way? Am I the driver? Am I the one trying to control everything? Or am I listening to God and letting him go first? And you know as well as I know that this world can hurt at times. Circumstances, people. But the great thing is that we have God with us and he wants to show us his love and his kindness and his power. So what do we need to know? That the Christian life is gonna be a fight between the spirit and the flesh. And why do we need to know that? Because winning matters. Winning matters. People will experience Christ through us as moms and dads and individuals as we're walking by the Spirit and our family is transformed and our neighbors are transformed and our workplace is transformed and this church is transformed until every name, every name, every person in our city sees the goodness of God through our lives. So I wanna challenge you, church, this week to bring this passage up, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, and meditate on it. And every time you feel anxious, give it to God. Go for a little walk, ask Him to step in. Every time you don't feel loving, every time you don't feel joyful, give it to God and ask because the Holy Spirit is with you, that His power would be manifest through our church. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we praise you for your goodness to us and the simplicity and the clarity of your word. If anyone is feeling any guilt, any shame, any condemnation, any defeat, any discouragement, Lord, right now I pray that you would just come to that person and encourage them of your incredible love for them. You never leave any of us alone, Lord. You died that we could have a relationship with you and be made right with you. Oh, Jesus, show us of your care and your love and your concern for us. And God, though we struggle, God, help us to just abide in you this week, that we would be fruitful. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Love you, church.